Now, for the final third part of the podcast, I would like to very briefly, uh, because it's such a large area and I'm limiting time, but briefly would like to consider what are the cognitive consequences of being bilingual or multilingual. And before I go into the subject of bilingualism as such, I would like to highlight that uh, it's part of the which is simply that our experiences change us in a very profound ways. Our experiences will have significant effect, not just on our behavior, but they may even have effect on the neurological and neurophysiological substrate of our behavior. So they change how we behave, but they also tend to influence our brains to some extent. In other words, we become what we do a lot. And I'll first use some non-language examples. So, to point out that we do become what we do a lot. For example, it has been shown that people who play video games a lot do not necessarily waste all the time because one of the benefits of l playing video games a lot is that they tend to have enhanced selective visual attention compared to the people who don't engage in such a behavior. Also, it has been demonstrated that architects have superior visual spatial ability to non-architects. And speaking, as I was mentioning a moment ago, that it can change even our neural substrate. There have been studies such as the one that showed that taxi drivers in London have enlarged region of a hippocampus, part of the brain which seem to be in charge of spatial navigation compared to people who don't have to know London by heart or uh, that people who are proficient musicians with string instruments such as guitar, violin, cello have enlarged regions in their brain that correspond to the four fingers of the left hand that are used for fretting compared to non-musicians. So yet again, what we do a lot is what we become. It changes us on a deep level. But what happens with bilingualism because that's a topic of this podcast? Well, with bilinguals, it has been shown, uh, when we look at the neurological level, that density of gray matter of the part of the cortex which seem to be involved in vocabulary acquisition is more dense compared to monolinguals. And this change in density is even more pronounced in people who are early bilinguals and people who are proficient bilinguals. But what is the consequence on the behavioral level? Is bilingualism something that is good for us or not? Will being bilingual improve performance of a cognitive system? Will it make it worse? Or will it just simply not matter? Well, the answer is, it depends. Sometimes it makes it better, sometimes it makes it worse. So let's first consider uh, one aspect of language performance where being bilingual may make it worse. It has been reported over and over uh, that bilinguals tend to have somewhat smaller vocabulary within one of their languages, each of their languages, compared to monolinguals only language. Uh, here is example of a recent study by Bialystok and Fang where they have looked at standardized scores from vocabulary tests of nearly a thousand children aged between five and nine and half of the children were bilingual, other half were not. Now, most of the children, almost all the children, have scored within the normal range of appropriate vocabulary development for their age group. However, there was reliably higher score in a monolingual group over bilingual group. So this vocabulary gap was there and remained constant throughout the sample, regardless of the age. But then in some other aspects of language performance, children that learn well, and grow up with more than one language, tend to perform better. So they lose out on sheer vocabulary size, but it seem to be better when they're faced with metalinguistic tasks, tasks that require them to reflect on the structure of the language. And I will use example from a study that have used grammaticality judgment task, which simply meant they would show children sentences and ask, is this sentence grammatical or not? So, for example, if a child is showed a sentence, apples growed, growed on trees, they should say, no, it's not grammatically correct. And both groups, monolingual and bilingual children, were equally good in detecting grammatical anomality. 
But what happens when we present children with a sentence which is grammatically correct, but is semantically anomalous, such as apples grow on noses? So grammatically the sentence is fine, but our world knowledge tells us it's nonsense. What they observed there is that bilingual children were superior in not getting confused by the, grammatic, by the semantic anomality and still be able to say, yes, this sentence is okay, it is grammatically correct. Because it seems that the level of attention to, that is needed to ignore misleading semantic anomaly is something that was easier for bilingual children to engage in and to not get carried away by that, but to be able to judge the task as was given to them. Therefore, they have shown better uh, metalinguistic skills. But what happens as people age? Because here I talked only about the children. Well, there is lots of studies that uh, seem to suggest that bilingualism is beneficial throughout the lifespan. While studies with children have largely focused on their language development, because of course we're looking at children that are still developing language, a lot of studies with adults, either adults or people who are or elderly people, have focused on the effect of being active bilingual through large parts of their life on not just language but the other cognitive functions as well. And there is now plenty of evidence that active bilingualism can effectively delay cognitive aging, even to the point that it can delay the onset of uh, in old age of things such as semantic dementia and Alzheimer. So it seems that being bilingual does help building up some sort of cognitive reserve that spills outside the language system and helps other aspects of our cognition to kind of stay more active. Perhaps one of the reasons suggested for that is that uh, when one can speak about the world in more than one way, they have to choose what is the right way to do that for each given circumstance. So therefore, they constantly need to engage in very active inhibition and response selection that seem to be something that keeps our cognitive system functioning well into the old age, in the same way that uh, somebody who is very physically active in their day job do not need to go to the gym as much as somebody who does office work because uh, they get all the exercise they need. Now let's summarize this last part with some concluding remarks. So first we have learned that bilingualism seems to be one of the experiences that can influence cognitive function and cognitive structure, as well as other experiences because we tend to be changed by things we do a lot. Uh, but this picture is not simple, because sometimes the influence of having more than one language can be positive, while in other cases it can be negative. And it's always the question of a trade-off. One thing that we can take home from this, which is even bigger than the topic of being bilingual as such, is that uh, experience is something that plays a powerful role in cognitive function and cognitive organization, and that cognitive system is highly integrated architecture where developments and processes that go on in one part of the system, language for example, will have the ability to influence other parts of the cognitive system such as for example attention and ex executive functioning. Well, I wish that there was more time because there are so many interesting studies and findings I would have loved to speak about but I hope that I have managed to illustrate some of the key points and explain to you the benefits and the importance of this type of research and highlight why it is one of the growing areas in terms of issues and debates that quantum psychology is dealing with at the moment. And uh, thank you for listening.